this online gathering, a special Christmas Eve service for Salmonach Baptist Church and Sandwich Church of the Nazarene. My name is Pastor Matthew Jones, and I want to just take a moment and say welcome. Thank you for taking some time with your family this evening to gather around a screen and to spend some time in the scriptures and in prayer. I'm so grateful that you've chosen to worship with us. I'll begin our time in worship by reading from Psalm 96. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be, to be revered above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord is king. The world is firmly established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all it fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. Amen. Amen. I'd like to add my Christmas greetings to Pastor Matthew. I'd like to welcome everyone from Salmonach Baptist Church and also from Sandwich Church of the Nazarene. We're grateful that we can, through this technology, do some sort of Christmas Eve celebration that honors our King, but then also keeps everyone safe. We do especially want to invite you to enter into this Christmas Eve service in a participatory way. There's at least one way you can do that. If you would somewhere around your house, and I bet this time of year that's pretty easy to find, would you find a candle? Later on, we're gonna read the Christmas story and Pastor Matthew is gonna play Silent Night. And our typical practice during this time of year is to have that be a candlelight experience. And I love the notion of even though we are separate but somewhat together, as we hear the Christmas story and as we also um, just experience that moment, that we are all experiencing that by candlelight together. So that's one way that we'd ask you to participate with us here in this Christmas Eve service. We light these candles as a sign of the coming light of Christ. Advent means coming. We are preparing ourselves for the days when the nations shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, 
and a little child shall lead them. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it shall bloom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The Lord will give you a sign. Look, the virgin is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. God is with us. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. O God, you have caused this holy night to shine with the brightness of the true light. Grant that we, who have known the mystery of that light on earth, may also enjoy him perfectly when heaven and earth are made one, where with you and the Holy Spirit. Christ lives and reigns, one God in glory everlasting, and all of us said together, Amen. Amen. Our reading from the Old Testament prophets this evening comes from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. But there will be no gloom for those who were in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as, with pe as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the trampling warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Amen. This is God's word. reading comes from Titus chapter 2 verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce impiety and worldly passions, and in the present age to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly while we wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. He it is who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify for himself 
a people of his own who are zealous for good deeds. Amen. We now invite you into a special time of prayer, prayers of intercession. When you hear me say, in your mercy, you can repeat along with Pastor David, Lord, hear our prayer. O oh God, you grant justice to your chosen ones who cry to you day and night. So we pray always and do not lose heart. Generous God, you come among us bringing peace to earth. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. You come to us in humility. We pray for ourselves and those dear to us. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. In your goodness, you prepare a home for the poor. We pray for our community and for our neighbors. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. You became poor so that we may be rich. We pray for the church in all places that we may be one. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. You give new life to those who are starving. We pray for the world that your reign may come and your will be done on earth. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. We offer you other concerns we carry in our hearts. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. God of prophetic promise, your radiance penetrates our wintry night. Come to us in tender compassion that we too may walk the path of peace in holiness and without fear. We pray in the name of the one whose birth a heavenly host heralded. Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy, thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We often need someone who matters to say, I got you, and mean it. Lydia Caesar needed someone who matters to say, I got you, and mean it. She grew up in the strict fishbowl environment of being a PK. PK is an acronym for a pastor's kid, and she grew up in a larger church that was pastored by her father, and 
My children especially can know that that is a difficult experience sometimes growing up as a pastor's kid. She was known in her church for asking questions and for needing explanations and not being disrespectful by any means, but by just asking questions that sometimes Sunday school teachers prefer not to be asked. As she grew older into her teenage years, she met a boy whom she loved, and she fell in love with him very strongly, and she made some mistakes, and she ended up pregnant. She told her mom first because she felt like her mom would understand and her mom could be trusted to keep her secrets, but then her and her mom uh, made a plan for her and her boyfriend and her mom to meet with her dad so that they could share this difficult news with her father. When she told her dad, he said nothing for what seemed like 20 to 30 seconds. And he finally replied to her, not with care, not with concern, but with selfishness. How could you do this to me? Lydia needed someone who matters to say, I got you and mean it. Yulinda and I needed someone who matters to say to us, I got you and mean it. Halfway through our second year of seminary, we were uh, feeling particularly lonely, living in downtown Dallas in a very downtown area, close to a hospital. Most nights there would be helicopters flying by our apartments. It was a very loud, very urban area, and we were feeling particularly lonely. Yulinda's dad was sick and wasn't doing well at all. And Alethea had just been born. And shortly after her birth, Alethea had had some trouble breathing. And we were feeling very lonely, very frightened, and very vulnerable at Baylor Hospital in downtown Dallas. We needed someone who matters to say to us, I got you, and mean it. Probably at some point during this year, all of us, have needed someone who matters to say to us, I got you, and mean it. In the 8th and 6th centuries before Christ, Judah needed someone to say to them, I got you, and mean it. What's more, they needed God to say to them, I got you, and mean it. Judah, in the 8th century, found themselves as the lonely, vulnerable people of God. Our reading in Isaiah chapter 9 begins with the conjunction, but that tells us that the narrator wants us to contrast the promises that are made with what has just been described in chapter 8. Chapter 8, verses 16 to 22, describe the lonely vulnerability of God's people. Ahaz and Hezekiah had shown great promise, yet their leadership has only led to injustice, and darkness. In verses 11 to 15 of chapter 8, the narrator describes how the sins of Judah have led them to exile. Starting in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 11, For the Lord spoke thus to me, while his hand was strong upon me. Isaiah is described here as being seized by something greater than all of the turmoil around him. The Lord spoke to him and warned me, Isaiah says, not to walk in the way of this people, saying, do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy, and do not fear what it fears or be in dread. Does that not sound like that was written in the United States in 2020? Verse 13, but the Lord of hosts, him you shall regard as holy. Let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. And when you then properly align yourselves with him, he will become a sanctuary, a stone one strikes against. For both houses of Israel, he will become a rock one stumbles over, a trap and a snare for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. Isaiah here is described as one who is so clinging to Yahweh, 
and everyone everyone around him is clinging to political rulers, is is clinging to even Judah kings, is clinging to um, just agreements made with Egypt to help protect them from Syria and Assyria. And Isaiah says, I am going to be different. And the reason is because God has given to Isaiah and through Isaiah signs. Verse 18 of chapter 8. See, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. So even during this chaotic time, God has still been speaking through his prophets and Judah isn't listening. Verse 19. Now if people say to you, consult the ghosts and the familiar spirits that chirp and mutter, should not a people consult their gods, the dead, on behalf of the living, for teaching and for instruction? Surely those who speak like this will have no dawn. They will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry, and when they are hungry, they will be enraged and will curse their king and their gods. They will turn their faces upward, or they will look to the earth, but will only see distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they'll be thrust into thick darkness. Isaiah, I think here, is getting a little bit angry as he has felt very alone in holding to Yahweh and his promises. And it's almost as if Isaiah just wants to end everything at chapter 8 as the lonely vulnerability of God's people is described. Judah has created a hopelessly lonely situation for themselves. They are not innocent in bringing this situation upon themselves. They have made mistakes. They have neglected the poor. They have searched after political idols. They have not trusted in the promise of God. They've trusted in earthly, violent kings. And Isaiah is frustrated with these people. But thanks be to God, Yahweh loves Judah more than Isaiah is frustrated with Judah. So after describing the lonely vulnerability of God's people, God realizes that Judah needs him to say to them, I got you and mean it. And that's the context in which this very familiar Old Testament Christmas passage is given to us. So after describing the lonely vulnerability of God's people, now chapter 9 describes the sure stability of God's promise. And God's promise is one of transformation. In verses 1 to 3, God will transform the darkness with light. Verse 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. One Old Testament scholar describes it this way, on them a great light has beamed. Those who live in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. So the lonely vulnerability of God's people is now met with the sure stability of God's promise. God's promise to transform darkness with light. Verses 4 to 5, God's promise to transform violence with peace. So now he describes the Assyrian and Babylonian yoke that is on the shoulders of Judah. For the yoke of their burden, Isaiah 9, 4, and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. That's calling back Judges and and, and Gideon and how God fought for them and they just trusted him. Verse 5, for all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. Here's the transformation. The violence of the world is going to be transformed with peace so that all of the evidence of the earth's violence can now be made into a peaceful campfire. God will transform violence with peace. And he will do this by, verses 6 and 7, sending the rain of heaven in person. Now a promise is made that heaven is going to send an emissary from heaven to bring in personal form the reign of heaven to earth. For a child has been born for us, 
son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with righteousness and with justice from this time onward and forevermore. So the good news of Christmas is that the lonely vulnerability of God's people is met with the sure stability of God's promise. We often need someone who matters to say to us, I got you and mean it. Lydia Caesar needed someone who matters to say, I got you and mean it. And she didn't find that in her earthly father. So Lydia with her mom developed a plan to be honest with her church family and to share her situation. So what she decided to do was to write a letter to then be read to her church family. In that letter, she asked her church family for grace and help. She stood nervous in front of her church family, too afraid to look up. She looked down at her paper even after she was done reading her confession and for what seemed like at least 20 or 30 seconds of silence. What followed was applause. What followed was hugs. What followed was these women that Lydia had regarded as these judgmental church ladies came up and embraced her and said, I had my three children out of wedlock, and we find in you such an example of bravery and trusting in the good news of Jesus. And we want to help you, and we want to love you, and, and, and we want to welcome with you this gift of God into the world. And in her church family, Lydia found someone who matters to say to her, I got you, and mean it. Through forgiveness and empathy, Lydia found in her church family people who said, we got you, and they meant it. You, Linda, and I... In 2004, in downtown Dallas, needed someone to say to us, I got you and mean it. We found that in my parents, who drove a thousand miles overnight to come and stay with us in our apartment to look after Dalen Grace while we looked after her new baby sister. And they came to meet their newest granddaughter and to help out me and their daughter-in-law. By doing this, they said to us, I got you and we knew they meant it. David Nichols was a coworker of mine who cleaned pools with me. And during days of work that I missed, during days that I couldn't afford to miss work, David Nichols cleaned pools for me and then gave me the time cards that should have been for him, gave those to me. In a dear brother, a fellow seminary student, I found someone who matters saying to me, I got you, and I knew he meant it. In the 8th century BC, in the year 2020 around the world, Judah and all the nations need God to say, I got you, and mean it. The end of our reading in chapter 7, this is what Yahweh is saying. It says, and the final promise, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is the prophet's way of saying, Ahaz won't do this. Hezekiah won't do this. Egypt won't do this. Syria won't do this. You need to, like Gideon and his men who trusted God at Midian, you need to let God save you. You need to not trust in early politicians in whom there is no salvation, you need to not get wrapped up in all of the fear and anxiety and conspiracies of the 8th century. You need to trust the zeal of the Lord of hosts to do this. So he says to Judah and to all the nations at the end of Isaiah 9, verse 7, I got you. But the question we must now consider is, how can we know? He means it. 
How can we know he means it? Here's how we know he means it. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told them. This is the good news of King Jesus. I now invite you to receive a final benediction wherever you are, whether you're surrounded by loved ones or you find yourself, like uh, Pastor David reminded us, the nation of Israel, lonely. I invite you now to put your hands in front of you in a posture of reception to receive this gift from God. May God strengthen us according to the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but is now disclosed. 
Amen. Amen. Peace be with you. Peace be with you this Christmas. 